My name is Amy Radinskaya, and I teach mathematics at Pomona College, which is one of the Claremont Colleges in California near Los Angeles. I think I always liked math, and I think I was always good at it. I remember my dad kind of showing me off to his friends at cocktail parties, saying like, I, when I was four years old, you know, look at Amy, she can add and subtract any numbers you want. And it, and I, um, I really liked the patterns that you saw in numbers. So I remember uh, just loving the multiplication tables, how they made these patterns of numbers and how the numbers stretched off to infinity in both directions. And so I think I always loved that about it, but I, I never really thought of myself as a mathematician, Funny, funnily enough. It was never, never occurred to me that that was something someone would do. So I, I think this love of patterns is what fed into my first passion, which was music. So I, I wanted to be a musician. That's what I wanted to be since I was you know, six years old. And so after high school, I joined an orchestra and I played professionally for about 10 years as a cellist. Even though I still liked math, like I always had a book of math problems under my seat during rehearsal for when things got slow. But it wasn't until I had a baby and that life of a professional musician got to be impossible to do with a small being. And so I decided to go back to school. I went to college and I really still didn't, I wasn't saying I'm gonna be a mathematician. I thought I'd always go back and do computer music, something, I don't know. But um, one thing led to another and, and there I was in grad school and then I had my PhD and, and now I am a professor. So it, I can't really point to one moment when I knew that except that um, I suppose when I, when I took that job, my first math job, which was a postdoc. The kind of math I do is called dynamical systems which is studying how things change over time. So when I think about it, it's the perfect thing for me because you know music is patterns that change over time. I always love patterns. And so dynamical systems is looking for patterns, looking how they disappear, looking for chaos, all that stuff. And my PhD was in something called ergodic theory, which I think I picked because it sounds so cool, but it, it's, a, it's a study of dynamical systems, so things that change in time, but you're also looking at random processes as well and where those two things intersect. Because I find that fascinating. You know, what's the difference between something that's random and something that's just very, very complicated, but hard to understand. And then since I got my PhD, I've done a lot of research in mathematical modeling, which is taking those dynamical systems and using them to describe processes in the real world, like how tumor cells interact with immune cells and how you could use that description to maybe prescribe a vaccine for cancer, which is something that tries to boost the immune system, but not too much and just at the right time and how to give how much, when. And so um, I've done a lot of that kind of applied mathematics recently, which is also really cool. So I was a single parent with a very small child when I started undergraduate. And that was challenging because I never got enough sleep. And I know this is not unique to being a mathematician. All mothers and mothers don't have enough sleep. But I think it's really hard to do math when your brain is sleep deprived. So remember that students. And then as a, as a graduate student, so when I started grad school, my son was starting kindergarten. I thought, great, he'll be in school all day. We'll both be going to school. It'll be easy. But I, little did I know kindergarten gets out, guess what, at 1130 in the morning. <laughs> and so I was struggling to try to, I had no money to pay anyone to help me. So there was a lot of bartering, exchanging stuff with people. I, I owe my career really to the goodwill of many, many other mothers at uh, Stanford. <laughs> you know, mostly wives of people going to school. But um, so that was a big challenge was just struggling the, the time commitments 
and not being able to fully, you know, engage like other other students. But really the the hardest thing I think was this sense of not belonging that partly came from being different, sort of in a different stage of my life and stuff, but also there were zero women faculty at Stanford when I was there in the math department. There were zero women faculty at Rice where I was a postdoc. There were very few women faculty at UC Berkeley where I did my undergrad. And so this sense of not belonging was uh, there with you always. And then, then the things that people would say, either you know, implicit or very explicit sexist things like, oh, well, you know, once you find a man, you're going to quit or oh, you're, you're too old to, you know, do math. That was a really common one. Um, and just, you know, basically you're not, you're not smart enough, young enough, male enough to do, to do this job. And that I think is why I've devoted so much of my professional life to helping women and people from other traditionally underserved groups in mathematics to succeed because, um, you know, I sure could have used a little more <laughs> belief in me at that time. So I would say that's the biggest, that was my biggest challenge. So I think one of the, my proudest accomplishments is the sustenance and taking over and directorship of the EDGE program, which is a program that's been around for over 20 years. EDGE stands for Enhancing Diversity in Graduate Education. I didn't start it. I just was involved from the beginning, but I took over as director and president of this foundation in 2013. And um, it's just an, just, I'm so proud of all the women who get through, get their PhDs or get their masters and go do wonderful things in the world. There's over 260, 70 women now in this, who've been through the program. We're well over a hundred PhDs and they're women from all backgrounds and all, all places. And that makes me really proud. So my first role model, very critical for me, was Jenny Harrison, a professor at UC Berkeley. So I told you there weren't very many women, but I was very fortunate to, to get to know her. She became my undergraduate advisor. She did dynamical systems, which I liked, and she was learning to play the cello. So we bonded over that. And um, she just believed in me and made me think I could, I could do this and encouraged me to go on to grad school. She also faced terrible challenges. Uh, while I was there, she came up for tenure and there was a big, uh, she was denied tenure, it went to the courts. They decided it was uh, sexism because they compared her case with other, et cetera. But it was just very traumatic um, for me. But again, I think it pushed that stubbornness determination button. Like, we need to change this. <laughs> so she was very important to me and then, um, the two women I have to mention, Sylvia Bozeman and Rhonda Hughes, who founded the EDGE program, but they were really very critical to my development after my PhD. And they were, they were very supportive um, and just held me up and took me forward, gave me wisdom and love for years. So. So all through my career, there have been people that have sort of doubted me until, as we said before, you know, you're too old. You can't be a good teacher and a good researcher. You know, you can't, uh, you'll give up as soon as you find a man, et cetera. And you just have to turn those voices off. And um, if you like doing math, if you like teaching math, if you like just playing with it, that's what, that's what you should do. And don't let anyone tell you you can't. And my, my motto for living really is um, up the fun quotient. So if you're having fun, that's good. The fun quotient is how much fun you're having divided by how much time you have. So make that as big as possible and don't let anyone stop.